favorite places in all of you, and that's the Anselmo Wine Yard. Um, I have been doing um, lots of work there in the last few years as Butte Silverbow's Historic Preservation Officer. That work I've been um, working in conjunction with um, people in our Reclamation Department, Julia Crane, Eric Hassler, and John Sesso, to um, do some improvements to the buildings and structures in the mine yard so that can, we can make um, they're more conducive for um, tours. And we're really hoping that someday that people driving between Yellowstone and Glacier uh, will know that they could stop at Butte and go take a tour of the Anselmo and hopefully some of our other mine yards. But as part of that effort, um, I've also done a lot of research on the Anselmo and um, so this talk, I want to share some of the, um, the history that I find out about the mine with a focus on the evolution of its built environment, as well as hopefully if I don't talk too long about history, which is my favorite thing, um, I'll show you some of the improvements that we've been able to make in the last couple of years. So we'll just get started here. So this is a, a, a map showing um, all the buildings and structures that are um, existing at the Anselmo Mine Yard today. And it's a huge complex. You know, it's located um, over on the west side of Butte, um, just east of um, the Excelsior Avenue and north of Caledonia. Um, it is it is the most intact mine yard surviving in Butte today, and that's what makes it such a great resource for historic interpretation, because it has all these buildings and structures that supported underground operations, and some things that we ne may never think about are on display here. So that's one of the reasons that um, we really want to promote the Anselmo for heritage tourism. Now that Anselmo is best known as a big copper and zinc producer, but you know its antecedents go back into the 1870s when it was an 80s um, during Butte's silver boom. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is that silver boom really took place in what we call the Anselmo load. But the mine site that we know today as the Anselmo mine site is on what we call the tribal load. If you look here, that, that <laughs> lot of buildings, that's, that's what I showed you here. They're on the trifle load. But the trifle and the Anselmo and the Anselmo number two were consolidated <coughs> together at some point, And they became the primary, although not the exclusive, um, mining claims of the what we know today as the Anselmo mine. So when people think of Butte's history, we, we really get caught up with, you know, it's, it, its emergence as a big copper producer in the 1880s and, and a copper producer um, world class through, uh, through World War I. But if you go back, um, like many places, Butte really began. Um, the first people came here in the early 1860s looking for gold. And they found gold down in Silver Bowl Creek, and then they followed the gold up the gulches, um, and, they, and they found gold in the gulches as well, but they also found outcroppings of ore. At that time, they didn't have the mining capabilities or milling capabilities. We were very isolated to extract that ore and get it to distant markets. But that changed in 1875 when a man named, um, by the name of William Farland took some ore from what was then known as, known as the asteroid mine. It was later became known as the Trevonia. And he took some of that ore down to Utah and he had it smelted and it proved to be really high grade silver ore. So he came back to Butte and with financing from William Clark, he constructed a tin stamp mill called the Dexter Mill and started successfully processing silver ore from the Trevonia mine. 
Now what he was doing is he was just reducing it down. He wasn't, you know, making it into fine silver, but reducing it down enough so it's economical to transport to distant markets for concentration into um, pure silver. But Farland's success just spurred a big um, boom in Butte, and that and really started what the founding of what we know as Butte today. Prospectors came and they started searching all over for silver ores, and um, a German man by the name of um, Ferdinand Hirsch in <laughs> early August of 1875 discovered what we call the what he called the Anselmo load, and that, as you know, that that's I just showed you on the uh, map. It's the load that's just north of the mine site today, and. Um, Anyway, and he, I, I thought this, he um, went to the courthouse or in Deer Lodge and filed a claim on this. Um, and he noted that it was on the west side of the Missoula Gulch, about a quarter mile west of Butte City and a half mile east of the summit of Big Butte. Hmm. Now at that time, miners would go out and they'd stake claims and they'd locate them. And then they, to, and that, you know, gave them quasi-legal title. They could buy and sell interest in the claim, but they had to work it every year and report on their work, you know, just digging little shafts and things like that and doing minor production to keep title. You didn't get full title to a claim until you filed for patent. And I'm not going to go into that whole process, but these Anselmo mining claims were later patented in the 1880s. And this map here is from its patent. So um, Hirsch quickly followed his location of the Anselmo load with um, finding the Anselmo number two load. And then later, a few years later, man, later, a gentleman by the name of John Hosworth located and filed on the trifle mine side. Now Hosworth had um, been hired by Hirsch to work and explore the Anselmo and then Selmo load number two. So he was very, very familiar with the area. And eventually, he and his brothers kind of gained control of these three load claims. Now, um, the Hosworth brothers, the John was the oldest, then there was um, Emmanuel, and then Simon. They had been born in Switzerland in the um, 1830s and 40s, and then they came to the United States with their parents and settled in Wisconsin in the 1850s. Um, they farmed there, and they, I think all three brothers served in the Civil War, and then after the Civil War, John Hirsch came out to Montana in 1864 and went down to Adler Gulch to work in the gold mining boom there. Out of Gulch to work in the gold mine boom there by Virginia City. Um, he stayed there until 1868. Then he went back to Wisconsin, got his wife and children and his brothers, and they came back to Montana. And initially, they settled in um, by Deer Lodge, and they farmed out there until 1875 when they heard about the silver boom in Butte, and they came to Butte. And this picture here is a very, one of the earliest photos of Butte that I know of. It is in 1875. It's taken from the East Ridge and it's looking southwest towards Butte. Um, the white building that you see there was the Hotel de Mineral, <laughs> not pronounced words right today, um, and that was built by John and Simon Houseworth. The hotel was in the middle, is the middle building, um, and then the building to the um, right was at the, on the corner, and it was a saloon, and then there was a post office. And this building was at the corner, the southwest corner of Main and Broadway. Um, later on, it became the site of Clark Brothers Bank, and now it's where, um, and then it was in the, in the 1960s, it became the site of the Prudential Building, which is home to um, D.A. Davidson. It's that really modernistic kind of spaceship 
looking building there. So that gives you a little idea of, um, of the Hirsch brothers, that they were, you know, um, really pioneers of Butte. They really became involved in the mining industry, though. They went out and located a lot of other claims and worked a lot of other claims on other sites. But the Anselmo became their main property. And they started um, working the Anselmo in earnest in 1880. And they had two shafts on the property that they were working at. Their east shaft, they had a whim there. And on their west shaft, they and the whim was a, a hoist, not really a hoist, but a, it, was a, it was used to help raise buckets of ore from underground. But at their west shaft, which became their main shaft, they installed a steam power hoist. And, um, if you look up at the Anselmo load there, or here, you can see here's their um, two, two shafts. Hmm. And, uh, I think I got that wrong. They had their um, steam powered hoist at their E shaft. Anyway, um, they worked really hard and they pushed those two shafts down to about 400 feet and they mined. Um, very high grade silver ore. They sent it to a local mill, Silver Bowl Mill, to be reduced prior to being sent out of the district for concentration. Their ore as averaged about 100 ounces of silver per ton, which is quite a bit. And by 1882, they had um, earned about between 600 dollars and $700,000 in silver. They also had a partner by then, um, Adele Jacobs, who was the wife of Butte's first mayor, Henry Jacobs. That's a picture of Adele there. Um, she owned a one-eighth share of the, um, of the Anselmo mine, of the Anselmo load, excuse me. And then in, 18, in early 1882, the Hershes and Adele formed the Anselmo Mining Company. And they were going to keep planning big things, but then all news of the Anselmo in the um, literature that I reviewed just dropped. They just, I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know if water hampered, water in the shaft hampered their operations or their, um, they lost their lead of good ore. But anyway, the Anselmo essentially shut down at that time. Also, another thing that probably impeded their work was that John Hirsch, who was the main um, miner in the family, he died in 1884. And so anyway, the, um, and some kind of went dormant after that. But there was one major event that took place there in the ensuing decade in 1895. Adele's, I have to just talk about this because I'm so into the Jacobs family. <laughs> Adele's son, Simon Jacobs, who was the cat? He had been the county treasurer for five years, and um, had done was very well respected in the community, just like his father Henry Jacob, Butte's first mayor. But on in early May of 1895, he went to the blacksmith shop at the Anselmo and committed suicide, shot himself oh. in the head. Oh. And it came out the next day that he had embezzled sixty thousand dollars from the county treasury. Wow. And it, much to my dismay, I cannot really figure out exactly what he did with all that money or why. There was lots of speculation. I think people in Butte didn't really want to think that their, one of their beloved um, community members would do such a thing. But it, it kind of, the, it points to that maybe he was a gambler and lost a lot of money gambling. But anyway, um, not soon after that, um, Lisi started to work the Anselmo mine again. And in 1900, a Lisi by John Kemp, or Don Kemp, decided to open a shaft on the trifle load. And you can see this is the little picture of the shaft right there. That is the 
first opening at today's Trifle Mine. Um, this right, this um, slide right here, or drawing right here, is from the Sanborn maps. And if you guys all attended Kim's talk a little while ago, you learned all about the Sanborn maps. But the Sanborn maps were produced by a fire insurance company. Um, they would come into cities periodically, go through and look at all the buildings and structures there, map them out, and they would code them by color as to what they were constructed of because that had a lot to do about how they would react in a fire. And so yellow was for wood and um, pink was for brick and blue became concrete. So you hear, see here that um, by 1902, the uh, Trifle Mine had a one compartment shaft, and there was a blacksmith shop, and they also had a, a hoisting engine, and it was and and uh, um, a boiler. That big thing in the black thing in the middle is a steam boiler. So they produced steam, which operated the hoist, which they used for mining. But I really didn't hear much about, more about what was going on at the Trifle for a little while. Um, you got at this time was the, um, the war between the Copper Queens was going on, and it was really impeding mining operations in Butte. But in 1906, in early, in February, the Copper King War ended and people started to do active mining again. And, <laughs> That's when a group of Butte businessmen, um, including Joseph McKinnis, who was Butte's mayor at the time, organized the Butte Copper Company to operate the Trifle Mine. Um, they got a lease on the property from the Hosworths, um, and then eventually they purchased some interest in the mine as well. So they made some major improvements to the mine, they erected the first head frame there. And this is the first head frame at the trifle. It was made of wood and, and did some other work. Um, here's This picture is from 1906, and that is the group of miners working at the trifle. And they hired John Hosworth's son, Robert Hosworth, to run the mine. And there he is right there. There was other Hosworth family members. There were so many sons and grandsons, I couldn't keep them all straight, but you can see Wilbur and Charles Hosworth. They ran two crews a day um, were, and, um, and were actively producing ore for about a year. <clears throat> when in 1907 they stopped operations. And here's what the mine looked like in 1907 when they stopped. Now I just wanted to put out, put out to you that this is looking from the south. So if you were like at the Anselmo mine, if you all know where it is over there, if you're down on Alabama Street looking north, you can see the head frame. And so there we have the shaft. You can see that they have the head frame, the blacksmith shop, which is the, and now they've added a new, new hoist. They added a new hoist um, house, and they had a larger um, hoisting engine. It was also steam powered. They had a tramway that went out to the dump. <coughs> now, when they stopped in 1907, people in Butte, in the Butte press, were just shocked. Um, but what had happened is the amalgamated company, or Anaconda Company, as I'm just going to call it, not to avoid confusion had gotten um, control of part of the company's stock. And the rumor on the street was that the, that, um, the Anaconda Company um, really wanted to take over the mine, but these, the local, the people associated with Butte Copper didn't want that to happen, so Anaconda Company saw to it that the mine was shut down. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not, I'd like to think that maybe the Anaconda Company really just wanted to tuck work at this mine to the side. They had, when they, during this period, they found that there was a good show of copper and zinc in the load. And I think the Anaconda Company was going great guns at some of their other big copper and 
copper producers and they wanted to focus in on that and then keep that um, tribal mine in reserve until they were ready to go for that. So the tribal lay idle, I think, for several years until the teens when, as you know, World War I broke out in Europe and butte copper and zinc became in high demand because it was helped to use to produce munitions for the war effort. And that was Butte's biggest copper mining area. And I think that the trifle reopened maybe in about 1915-16 by the Simon, Siemens Leasing Company. We don't really know that much about them. I couldn't find any accounts of production. But you can see, if you look at the 1907 Sanborn and you compare it to the 1916, um, the shaft had been enlarged to a two-compartment shaft. And the mine depth certainly had grown, so they had been um, doing some work there. But soon after that, in 1917, Clark Montana Realty Company took over operation of the trifle mine. And the Clark Montana Realty Company was the holding company for um, William Clark's mining and milling properties in Butte. And they, they did operations. But they were funded in the trifle by a new concern out of Germany. And I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sure. It was called the Bear Schoender Hire Company. And Bear Schoen Hire bought metals, bought and sold metals. And they really weren't supposed to be, they started with um, Clark Realty in 1917 before the United States entered the war. But once the United States entered the war, they weren't um, supposed to be operating in the United States because they were enemy, they were German. So they had two of their agents come over to New York and apply for American citizenship. Hmm. And so they were dealing with them. Hmm. Oops, I went the wrong way again. I'm going to go back. So anyway, Clark Realty, they operated the trifle mine on big way until 1921. I'm really not sure how much ore production, but I think they produced a lot of copper and zinc during that time. And then in 1922, the Anaconda Company, or no, um, the German company, Bear Schoender, <coughs> They reincorporated as the International Minerals and Metals Company. And they acquired, I believe, the Hosworth interest in the mining um, property. And they started mining in conjunction. They joined partnership with the Anaconda Company, which owned the, um, the other interest in the property. Now, I believe the International um, Minerals and Metals Company, they invested heavily in operations while the Anaconda Company actually, well, they formed a new company, excuse me, called the Anselmo Mining Company to mine the tribal mine. And at that point is when the mine became known as the Anselmo. Because actually, the mining at the tribal was going deep, and they were intersecting the veins and ore bodies that were, had been mined in the Anselmo. So they called it the Anselmo. So Anaconda and the International Metals and Minerals Company invested heavily in new developments at the Anselmo. They erected a new um, wood head frame and, um, and, and here you can see, uh, and here I tried to orientate this so you can see there's the head frame, the hoist house, and they also, at this time, erected a timber mill, which we today call the carpentry shop. And I believe that these two buildings, the um, hoist house and the timber, the carpentry shop, are the oldest two buildings that are still surviving at the Anselmo today. Um, the timber, or the carpentry shop, timber sign place, is where they would bring in timbers to use to. Um, they bring in timbers to, and they would cut them in this carpentry shop so they can make timber sets that they would use to frame the underground works. And so it was a really important thing. <laughs> so anyway, the, the
the, um, the Anselmo Mining Company operated the Anselmo big guns through the 20s. Um, and they produced lots of copper and zinc. And, and in 1929, the Anaconda Company said, okay, we've had enough of this. By time, that time, they had controlling interests of international mineral, metals and minerals stock. They bought out, and they, um, they bought them out, and they took over full operation and ownership control of the Anselmo Mine Yard and included it in their operations. <coughs> And they continued to mine heavily into the 30s. The depression slowed operations a little bit, but they, um, during this time, they sunk the shaft. The shaft had been down to the 2,000 foot level. They sunk it down to about the 3,000 foot level. And um, they mostly produced copper ore. And then in 1936, <coughs> They decided to really make the Anselmo into their, one of their major producers. And at that time, they took the old head frame from the Black Rock Mine, which had, was located over where the pit is today in the northern rim of the pit. Um, the Black Rock Mine had been shut down in 1930. It was a big um, copper and zinc producer. And, but it had kind of, um, its production had waned, and so the Anaconda Company bought that head frame to bring over and put up the Anselmo. And you can see here, this photograph is from September 1936. They're, they disassembled the head frame and then brought it over to the Anselmo and assembled it on site. They put the new steel head frame, which was 150 feet tall, over the wood, front, wood head frame, in other words, they kept the wood head frame intact so they could keep mining during operations. And it took them about over a year to get that all done. Um, but what I really like about this picture is it shows some of the other improvements that the Anaconda Company had made at the mine site um, during the 30s. Right here is an office building um, that is is still there today. Um, I'm not really, sh this is the old blacksmith shop from the um, 1907, and I'm really not sure what this building was, but I was excited to see the office building. <coughs> So here's another view of them assembling the new steel head frame at the Anselmo over the old wooden head frame. This is taken from, this is taken in 1937. It, you're down on Alabama Street looking north. That's the view that you would see today. So it's very interesting to see how things have changed. And this, this is the blue house right there and here's the apartment building. There were a whole group of houses on the north side of Caledonia hmm. that are all gone now. You can see how far down that waste pile, waste rock pile comes, and you know that's since been reclaimed and pushed up. So the Anaconda Company continued to mine at the Anselmo hot and heavy for the next several years. Um, production really increased in, 19, in the early 40s when World War II broke out in Europe. And again, um, that raised the prices for copper and zinc, which was needed for the war effort. Here is a 1942 map of the Anselmo Mine Yard. And you can see a lot of the things that are there on this map are what's still here today. The big gray building at the top is the main hoist house. This um, yellow building kind of in the middle, that became the auxiliary hoist house. It was the hoist house, I believe they added it in the 1920s. They uh, made it the auxiliary hoist house because by now the um, Anselmo had been converted into a three and a half compartment shaft. That means they had three holes going down and they used two of the compartments is where they raised and the raised ore to the surface. And the other compartment was um, reserved for lowering men and, mater and materials up and down so that they wouldn't have to interrupt um, operations of, of mining operations. And so, again, two of the compartments were used for um, 
for ore, one was used for men and materials, um, and then the half shaft is where they had water and airlines going down. Um, the Anselmo, I, I heard at one point, was the fastest shaft <coughs> on Butte Hill when it got down to the 104,100 foot level. It took two minutes for a skip car, and that's where they put the ore in, to be raised to the surface from the 4,100 foot level wow. up to the surface. To the surface, they um, had a workforce of, um, of over, of close to 800 or more men. One of the facilities that Anaconda Company provided was a change house for the miners. That's this big yellow building here. You go in there today, there's approximately 750 individual lockers. These wow. men would have worked three shifts. They would have had them work in three shifts, so you know maybe two, 200, 250 men per shift, miners. Um, when they'd start a ship, <coughs> the miners, they'd actually, went, at a start of a ship, they'd lower the miners down into the shaft <coughs> through the um, ore shafts. They'd move out the skips, which were the, car, the cages that they lifted the ore up to the surface, and they'd change them with what they called cages, and that's what they'd lower men down, and so they could take them down quickly. Um, they could get seven to eight seven to nine men in one of those little cages, and they'd have a string of four cages going down at one time. And so they do that, it'd take about half an hour, an hour to get everybody down there, and then they would start active mining. They would change out the cars so that the skips, the ore cars, were hanging over the shafts, or the ore, the main, oops, the main shafts, and then, um, Something with my microphone went dead. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep talking. Keep talking. So another building I wanted to point out is this um, yellow building over here. It's the office. That's the building that I showed you that was appearing on the 1936 map uh, photograph when they were reconstructing uh, are uh, assembling the new um, steel head frame. So the Insomo kept in operation through the war and through the 19, in, deep into the 1950s. In the 1950s, it was the biggest zinc producer in Butte, I believe. Um, <laughs> here's a picture of the Insomo. Here's a picture of that I believe was taken in the um, early 40s. And there's, there's the map, and so you can see the um, steel head frame. The structure on the um, south side of the head frame was a tipple. That's where they would take the, lift the ore up, and then it, it would, there was sizing grades in there, and it would go down. The railroad would go underneath, and they'd fill up the ore cars. Here's the auxiliary hoist house. Here's the main hoist house. Here's timbers. Um, they must have been um, discarded, not used, from the um, carpentry shop. And here's uh, um, the 1956, the last Sanborn map that I have of the Anselmo. And um, you can see there was some changes, a few changes made, but that's that's the Anselmo at its peak. So the Anselmo's mining operations came to an end in August of 1956 when the International Mine Union of <coughs> Miners, of Mines, Mills, and Smelters workers went on strike against the Anaconda Company. And it just shut down operations all over Butte. Um, these guys are, minor, are uh, railroad men, they're um, union men, and they are on strike as well. They're protesting against the BA and P Railroad, which I failed to mention, went along the north side of the mine, which was um, um, their, one of their, and you can see here, here's the main line, and the spur went in, and that was another reason that um, 
made the Anselmo Mine such a success. It was so close to the railroad line. Um, the strike went long, on longer than expected into 1960. And by the time it was over, the Anaconda Company had decided to shut down many of its underground mining operations, including the Anselmo, which they said were marginal in terms of profit versus cost of operations. And you know, by this time, the Anaconda Company had um, started block mining at the Kelly, which is a big mining operation, and they had opened the Berkeley Pit. And those were much more efficient operations, required less men, and so they had a higher profit ratio. So they shut down the Anselmo um, at this time, and it, it never reopened after that. So here's a photograph of the Anselmo today, where you can see some of the things that I talked about. The carpentry shop, the steel head frame, tipple towers, auxiliary hoist house, main hoist house, and some other buildings that I haven't talked about, garages, um, a hose house where they kept hoses, um, water hoses that they used for, uh, in case of a fire, they kept to maintain in case of a fire underground. And, um, and so recently, now I'm going to jump into the, the more recent past where Butte Silver Bow has started to do some work to rehabilitate the buildings at the Anselmo and make them available for heritage tourism. This work started in about 2010, um, and at that time they mostly concentrated on the main hoist house at the Anselmo, and, and here you can see some pictures of the exterior, but you can also see some of the interior. Um, this photograph up here, which is very dark, shows the cable drums. Those are the drums that the cable were round around, and those cables went up to the top of the, um, the head frame and then down, and that's what the cages and the skips were attached to, and the hoisting engine would operate those drums so that they could lift, raise, and lower, lower the cages. They had um, two drums so they could, one cage could be being lowered down through one shaft while another one was being lifted up or skip. You know, a skip coming up would be loaded with ore, but the, uh, an empty skip would be going down, but that would still provide a nice counterbalance to um, facilitate operations. And this um, photograph here is um, of the main level of the engine room. And um, I don't have a picture of the hoist, but the person there is standing at the hoist, the engine platform. And that's where the um, hoisting engineer sat and, um, and operated the hoist and kept track so that they could lower and raise um, the, the skips. <coughs> Here's a picture of the auxiliary hoist house, and um, some work was done on that um, in, in, the two, in 2010. We did some more window repairs after that. Um, one thing I'd like to say, I do think this was a, an earth, this hoist house was the main hoist house, probably built in the 1920s, when they um, added the new head frame. What purpose did the auxiliary hoist house Oh, I'm serve? sorry. The there auxiliary the hoist house um, lowered and raised the, man, the cages that they lowered and raised the miners in and out of the shaft. And, and, and they took just, machinery and, the and equipment. The, and the main was just for the ore. The main was just for the ore. It was the chippy hoist then? Yeah, it was the chippy hoist. It was also known as the chippy hoist. Um, and so when they, when they put the new head frame in and they built the new main hoist house, they took the old main hoist house and they made it into the chippy hoist house, or the auxiliary hoist house. And at that time, they raised it on a new concrete foundation and made it kind of a two-level building. And you can see, you know, I, I would always look at that building and it's like, why do they have that door way up there? You know? <laughs> and then it kind of sort of dawned on me that, you know, they, that had been, um, as part of its conversion from the main hoist house to the chippy hoist house. Now, the, or the auxiliary hoist house. And, that, and the auxiliary hoist house 
I, it had a, you know, a hoist in it, and when the an Anaconda Company sold that hoist, and so it, the, um, it's not there anymore. But on the main level, um, what's kind of fun to see is they have these battery chart batteries that they use to, did they use them to power the lamps? Um, are there so you can see some of the equipment still there. We'll probably never really take people into the Chippy Hoist house because it's kind of a mess. But this is the dry, and um, this is this is where the miners um, would come in the morning. They'd have their street clothes on, and they would go into the dry, and they'd each have their own locker, and they would take their street clothes off and put on their work clothes. They'd go underground, and then at the end of the day, they'd come up, and they would be able to go take a shower in the dry, and then put on dry off and put on their clean clothes before they went home. And this was really important because in early day mining in Butte, the mining companies didn't offer dries, and miners would go to work. And when you worked underground, they were often very hot. They and some was a very hot mine, and they would sweat and get all wet and they would come up in the middle of winter winter and it'd be you know below zero outside and they would walk home and catch pneumonia and die or so that it was really important um the hoist or the dry here it was um they had steam heat they had steam pipes that went under the um under the um lockers and so that they would warm the clothes, keep clothes at night, their wet work clothes would be warmed up and dry in the morning when they would come in. Mary? Yes? I have a question on that. Was that not um, in a union contract? Wasn't it the unions that actually secured that? <clears throat> Rather than I, the goodness of the Anaconda Company? I do believe you, I mean, I, I strongly believe you're right on that. I didn't <laughs> run out. <laughs> I don't think probably the Anaconda Company company did that or any money company necessarily did stuff like that out of the goodness of their heart but um so you're probably right you know I was asking some of the people I know when were the first dries when we when did we start seeing dries in Butte and they didn't know for sure they thought I should go back and look at all the Sanborn maps and all the see if I could find the first appearance of a dry on a Sanborn map and I didn't have time to do that but that would be a really fun thing to research so this is the dry um, before we started rehabilitation work, all the windows had been boarded. <clears throat> there, um, some people had broken into the mine yard and they had um, taken off some of the metal siding and gone in and took a bank of lockers out of that hole. Oh, you know, I guess you know to earn some to get some metal. So, and then there was this boardwalk on the. Um, east side that allowed you to get um, access into the first floor and the second floor and it was in um, disarray so what we did here is we took the boards off the windows and we rehabilitated the windows so to bring light back into the drive we put rock screens on them so that um, they hopefully will stay intact and there you can and we filled up this um, siding here so you can see that's the front of the building where the siding's been repaired the windows are restored that's the um, west side where the windows have been restored and here here's the damaged um, boardwalk on the east side and here it is we reconstructed it here's a restored window and here's a restored door so oops this is a picture I wanted to show you. <laughs> so hopefully soon we'll be able to take people into the dry. We need to do some asbestos testing and a little more work in there. But you can hear, you can see a row of blockers. And I need to do like a map or a, a site plan of the dry so I can figure it all out. But what I think there is is there's like four shower rooms in the dry. Here's um, a picture of one of the shower rooms. This was taken in 1985, but it was far better than any other picture I took. So I just wanted to show you what it looked like. It kind of looks like a Nazi concentration camp shower. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 
that's where the men would go in at the end of the day and shower. And but what I can't eat. find anywhere is any evidence of a toilet. No. Does anybody know anything about that? I mean, I don't think there were any toilets in the drive. You know, they did have bathroom facilities underground. There is a little building by the shaft that is, they call a toilet house. So maybe they were expected to go there 200 men before they came in and took a shower. <laughs> Obviously, as you can see, um, you know, do not urinate yeah. in showers. That might have been a problem. <laughs> Are those signs still there? Yes, yes, it wow. is. There's two of them in there. Another thing that's still there that is the, the most amazing thing is if you look in the soap dishes, there's still soap. Oh my little fragments of soap oh my from goodness. 1959. Yes? They're all interesting over in the dry house. Yes, the signs are still there out of six months ago. But in the dry house on the other side of this row here, the actual original hang tags and mine employees that actually worked the last shift yeah. are still hanging on. Yeah. yeah, there are several in there wow. that have the mine tags, and they, and you know, each miner got their own, their own um, locker. Wow. <laughs> and so here's the carpentry shop, which is my another favorite building that still survives at the Anselmo and has such great interpretive value. Here's what it looked at like when we started. You can't really see, it was just filled with junk. All kinds of stuff that had been put in there over the years. We didn't restore all the windows. We did a few to bring some light in. We put new boarding over it. We re um, fixed this door, um, made it so that you know, this door could open, and then cleaned up the inside. And it was it's just really fun to see now the equipment and the stuff that you can, and things left over. This picture over here shows what you can, part of what you can see. Um, so when they bring timbers to the mine yard, they bring them into the um, into the dry. Um, they had a, a rail line or a, or a track, and they would take them in, and then they would um, lift them by pulleys and put them on this. What this table over here is called a roller table, and then they would go down, and you can't really see where it is, but there was a um, a swing saw, and a swing saw was a big blade saw, round saw. It was, and they would. There was a measuring stick, um, a ruler on the ledge above the rolling table, and they would, and they would cut the timbers to length. And so they just rough cut them with that swing saw. Then they take them off, and they take them over to another table. And they would cut like notches on the tops and the ends, so they could, so they could be fit into square sets. You know, you have a, a, a seal or a lintel timber and two side <coughs> timbers would form a square set. They take the individual timbers, put them back on the mine or on the rail car, take them down over to the shaft, and then they lower them down and they assemble them into square sets underground. And that was really important to support the underground work so they wouldn't, wouldn't cave in on the men. And, and you can see those are saw horses there. They're, they're deeply grooved, and those must have held timbers. And you can see they're probably from the, when the building was first utilized. Um, there's some what we call garages on the east side of the property. They were out without doors, and so we we wanted to use them, be able to use them for storage. And so there was parts of a door left, parts of doors left inside, and we used those as a pattern and um, installed new, built and installed new doors, and painted them very bright because the historic preservation officer wanted paint on stuff because it lasts longer, and she picked out the colors and maybe she shouldn't have. <laughs> but they match the big doors on the main point. Yeah, it's it's that maybe lighter green. You know, people have been staining the wood at the mine yards instead of painting, but I don't I don't know. Stain just doesn't seem to last as well. So with this brand new wood, I wanted it painted. And then this was the little hose house that I told you about. You can't really see this; not a very good picture, but it was just filled with hoses, and it was full of junk. And here you can't, I'm sorry, you can't even see, but there's an axle reel. And this axle reel 
was actually, um, it was in the carpentry shop, but it really belonged here. And we set it back up and we, and it's where they wound the hoses, their cloth canvas heavy hoses around that axle wheel. So that's, that's a really fun thing to see as well. We did some more work, I, didn't, I thought I would talk longer, but I didn't, but uh, so I just would like to conclude here. Um, we are planning to um, do some more work at the Ensemble um, starting next year, and um, that will include more rehabilitation of the buildings, but we're working on doing an interpretive plan. We um, hope to hire somebody that can come and look at all the media that we have, especially here at the archives. We have photographs, we have taped interviews with minors, videotape and audio tape, and you know all kinds of things that we would love to be able to use to provide a really great interpretive center. So hopefully that will be coming soon. So thank you very much. Thank you.